my supreme acknowledgement to Mother Nature and her many creations, whose life forms have passed through the lab and revealed to my curious mind their often hidden capabilities. Cleve Baxter. There is a saying in China: they do not come alone, but in pairs. Soon after Baxter detected that plants have feelings, he made new, more serendipitous discoveries. One of them occurred as follows: Baxter was cracking eggs to prepare animal feed when he saw that the polygraph pen immediately started swinging. This triggered a thought: What will happen if electrodes are attached to an egg? Thus, on May 24, 1966, Baxter conducted measurements on a non-fertile egg in his New York lab. This is the tracing.、Uh... From the egg on a particular day, I can't get a tracing like this too often. But you see these little cirations here. This is the heartbeat, an accurate rate of the heartbeat of an egg embryo that would be around two or three days along in incubation. But this is a non-fertile egg. A non-fertile egg. I gotta show this to my polygraph people. Just a little piece of this, and say, "What's going on here?" They say, "Well, that's somebody that、uh, has real fast heartbeat, and they seem to be moving here, and they're maybe they're trying countermeasures." And I say, "What's wrong with you? After seven and a half weeks, you don't know that's an egg." <laughs> anyway, <laughs> after Baxter found that plants have feelings and eggs have heartbeats, the plants in his lab were often attached with various measuring devices. He discovered a pattern. The highest quality results came from experiments that were carried out under random conditions. In other words, those experiments occurred spontaneously rather than being purposefully arranged. During long-term monitoring of the plant life,、uh, I worked late at night and I had some yogurt in the refrigerator because I sometimes would miss meals, and so I decided I was going to have a,、uh, a container of yogurt that had strawberry jam in the bottom, and when I Turned up the strawberry jam into the yogurt. The plant reaction just went crazy. Here, the jacana plant was not in direct contact with the strawberry jam. The jacana was like an onlooker, observing Baxter eating his yogurt. When he only ate the yogurt without touching the strawberry, the jacana cane did not show any reaction. When he spooned the strawberry from the bottom of the yogurt, the jacana plant reacted. And when I put that spoon in the yogurt and turned it up, it went just it, it changed immensely. And、uh, as I look back on it, the only thing that could have happened is that the jam was either nutrient to the yogurt cells above it, or there was some kind of preservative in the jam that was affecting the cells that had not been in direct contact. And so I thought, "Wow, you know, this—I、uh, didn't realize there were even that there were, were live bacteria in yogurt." In other words, it is possible that the jacana perceived the microorganism's response to stimulation and then responded accordingly. So, what kind of sensing capability do the microorganisms in the yogurt have? Baxter discovered mutual responses among the bacteria on January 4th, 1976, in a lab in San Diego. Now, this is interesting. Where not only are bacteria conscious, where bacteria are tuned into other bacteria of a different type, friendly versus unfriendly bacteria, and watch what's happening here.、Uh, Sam, the Siamese cat, we got hooked on chicken. At least he convinced me of that. Would eat nothing but roasted chicken. Here is where、uh, I remove the chicken from the refrigerator.、Uh, this is what four rooms away from where the,、uh, the yogurt is being, the friendly bacteria is being monitored. The yogurt, and this is the yogurt tra tracing right here. And here I, I'm, st I'm, uh, uh, <clears throat> I'm starting to strip the the、uh, chicken from the carcass. This is a pretty old carcass now, and it's starting to get a bacterial buildup on it. Well, cats can handle that because they got a strong digestive system, but the bacteria were there. And here I'm disturbing the bacteria、uh, when I when I'm stripping it off the chicken. You can hear I put it under a heating lamp to bring it up to room temperature. Here, when the heat from the heating lamp hits the chicken in the dish, it is affecting the unfriendly bacteria to where the bacteria way up in the front room 
you know, is showing reaction. Here's the friendly reaction to the, to the unfriendly bad guy bacteria on the chicken. Okay, the next one shows where, then I stirred the chicken, took the cold chicken from the bottom of the dish, put it to the top, and again, put it back under the heating lamp. And here's what's happening up in the front room recording of the, of the friendly bacteria of the yogurt. And here is the unfriendly bacteria that is coating this chicken. And here, <clears throat> I set the dish down and the uh, sand started to eat the, uh, the chicken. Here is about the time it took, this is about 10 seconds, for the chicken to hit the digestive juices uh, of the cat. The word goes out and it flatlines from then on. In other words, the bacteria just stop reacting. Now, are there connections between a main body and the individual cells separated from the main body? This is a more fascinating question. Baxter found the answer with further experiments. He used a centrifuge to separate the cells gathered from a donor's mouth. Baxter connected the polygraph to the white blood cells, or leukocytes, and, through the donor's emotional changes, was able to observe the cell's response. The donor was a petrochemical business merchant. At the time, he was reading a news report about a congressional hearing concerning the implementation of additional controls over the chemical industry. When he became indignant, his cells responded likewise. Baxter also carried out many experiments on a cell's conscious response. When I had gotten the proper equipment to do my own uh, uh, white cell collection, because I had to get a centrifuge out of it, first I tried the procedure in collecting my own cells, but then uh, on a session when Steve was there at night, I let him collect his own cells. And he knew, he went, he knew the collection procedure, went through it, the, the, the whole procedure. We electroded the cells, and then the thing that I did with him is I put a camera over his shoulder as he was reading a magazine. In the magazine, there, had, uh, there was an article about, by somebody, Shockley, I believe was the guy's name, that was controversial at the time. And we got into a discussion about that. I said, well, gee whiz, my, uh, my, my partner have Playboy magazine down in his desk drawer because he subscribes to it. You know? So we went down, we found the issue, came back up, and not only did he find the Shockley article, but as he leafed through with the camera over his shoulder and his white cells being monitored, he got to the centerfold, which was a Bo Derrick. <laughs> and this is when there was that huge reaction. Uh, and uh, uh, after that, he could see that he knew what was going on in his mind and knew what he saw on those pages. And uh, I think that that, uh, that was for him the same as my February 2nd, 1966 observation was. It really was so powerful an observation that uh, I don't think he was a skeptic anymore. I think he was with the program. <laughs> Cleve and I were discussing things in the lab and we talked about a lot of things and William Shockley had, is a physicist and he had some very racially unpopular views, let's say, about genetics. And so we were discussing that and I mentioned, I said, yeah, I think it was in a Playboy article. And he said, do you know which one? And I go, no, I mean, I had no clue. And so that's, we went down and looked and found it was the current month or whatever and got up there and so we're looking through the, the article about the, the genetics and then Cleve came up with this great idea since we had the camera over my shoulder and my white cells attached. He says, well, why don't you look through the rest of the magazine and see what happens. I said, okay. So I was looking through things other than articles and and I came to one, one photo that actually seemed really nice. And when it happened, my cells just went crazy, okay? The ones that were electroded. And it was rather embarrassing, to say the least. And now I'm telling everybody about it, but that's okay. <laughs> um, at the time, I was a college student. And here I am, hooked up with my white cells and reading a Playboy magazine. And my cells are just reacting. And it turns out it was one of the longest pronounced reactions that we've seen. It lasted for like two and a half minutes or so. And finally, Clay said, wait a second, we can't keep doing this. So I said, okay. So I, I closed the magazine down and slid up out of the way. I said, okay, I'm just going to try to calm my mind down, close my eyes and just kind of think, okay. Just before I started to reach for the magazine because I figured my cells were calmed down enough. Another large spike. And so we all were getting a good laugh out of this. And this, 
this is what happened here. And it continued to happen. Then fi finally I said, Steve, why don't you close the magazine? Maybe this will quiet down, which it did here. Then he, then he was going to double cross me and he reached for the magazine and just reaching for the magazine caused that spike, you know? So I think it's extremely important. I think it's very, very important. And I think something needs to be done with it. And I, my ratio in interacting with people can't be one to one because that stagnates you. It, it will tie you all up. It's one to a million. Things that I can do that will affect a million people out there is what I'm trying to do. Nine is a very important number in my life, and I'm uh, uh, 81 now. That adds up to a nine, right? And the next time nine comes around is when I'm 90. So I'm going to give it my all until I'm 90 anyway. <laughs> it just, I mean, nobody can get him off course. I mean, it's something that he feels that it's very significant. And there are so few people that have that much conviction to go forward when everybody else is telling you you're wasting your time and you know, you're never going to make any money. But that's not his goal. His goal is not to make money. It's to get this research out. On no budget, no money for publicity, just me and my computer and, and letters, it's got this far. And Hopefully this research will open up some doors. To those who wonder why I felt such confidence, as one person who has experienced the indifference of many scientists in this field, I can simply state that such high resistance to new ideas does not concern me. I have a truly wonderful ally, Mother Nature. Cleve Baxter